student union, but we're in the same thing. And um, thank you especially to Commerce Bank, because they are loaning one of their employees to us for both of the sessions that we're doing this today about um, donate life. So we are really excited to have Sarah, and I'm going to massacre your last name, so I'm just going to skip that part. But she is with Midwest Transplant Network, right? Yeah. Which is through Donate Life, which is a national program. And this all kind of got started because two years ago, a lot of you know that I had a brother-in-law that killed himself. And my uh, sister-in-law and her family were able to donate some of his organs. And um, it made a big impact. Um, something that was a tragedy was able to turn out for better for someone else. So we are going to have Sarah talk. And then we also have Ashley. Can you raise your hand? From Commerce Bank, I'm sure all of you have seen her lovely face. She is actually a transplant recipient, and so she's going to talk about her experience. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. Um, you guys don't feel like it's too formal. If you want more cookies, feel free to go back in there and grab some more. Um, can I first start off with asking if anyone in the room, other than Ashley, of course, is a recipient or had a family member that was a recipient or a family member that's been a donor before? Or are you a living donor? Yeah, we have some connections to organ tissue donation. So today I'd like to go through and just kind of educate you guys about the process, clear up any myths. If you guys have questions, I definitely welcome them, but if you can just hold them to the end, in case I might cover it during the presentation. I'm going to begin with showing you a video that kind of summarizes the process, and then we'll get into the specifics on how it works in our service area. So my name is Sarah DeLiesel, and I work for Midwest Transplant Network. We are the organ recovery organization. <coughs> we procure all of the organs in our service area of Kansas and the western two-thirds of Missouri. So we facilitate the entire process. But right now, I'm going to show you our brief little video. Every year, many thousands of people receive the gift of life, a life-saving transplant of a heart, kidney, liver, lungs, pancreas, or intestines. And thousands more people receive corneas and other tissues that restore sight and health. Transplantation is one of the great medical advances of our time. How does it work? It all starts when someone's organ begins to fail, and that person will need a transplant to survive. A thorough evaluation is conducted at a transplant center, and if the person's a good candidate for a transplant, he or she will be put on the National Transplant Waiting List. Once a person is on the list, the wait for an organ begins. A national system matches people on the waiting list with donors. The factors considered in matching donors and recipients include blood type and body size, how sick the patient is, distance from the donor, tissue type, and length of time on the waiting list. What doesn't get taken into account? Organs are never matched based on race or gender. Income, celebrity, and social status are also never considered in matching donor organs to waiting patients. There's no telling how long the wait will take. In fact, some people don't receive an organ in time because the waiting list is very long and there aren't enough donors available. That's why an average of 18 people on the waiting list die each day. Imagine how many we could save if we all were donors. Most organs for transplants come from deceased donors. Here's how that happens. A person comes to the hospital with a life-threatening brain injury such as from an accident, a stroke, or lack of oxygen. The doctors work hard to save the patient's life, but sometimes nothing can be done. There's a complete, irreversible loss of brain function. The patient is clinically and legally dead. That's when being a donor 
can turn a time of loss into a time of hope. Because machines have kept blood containing oxygen flowing to the organs, they can be passed along. One person can give life to as many as eight people through organ donation and enhance the lives of 50 people or more through eye and tissue donation. But now, minutes matter. Matches must be found and transplants must happen quickly. The hospital contacts an organ procurement organization, an OPO. OPOs manage the organ recovery process. The OPO checks the state organ donor registry. If the person is already registered as a donor, they'll inform the family. If not, they'll ask the family to authorize donation. A medical examination takes place. They check the medical and social history. And if the person is eligible to be an organ donor, the computer begins the search on the national waiting list for well-matched patients. The best matched patients for each organ are contacted by their transplant teams. This is the call that every single person on the waiting list has been hoping for. The call that could mean a second chance at life. Now, the transplant happens. A surgical team recovers the organs, then corneas and other tissues. The organs are sent to the transplant hospitals where the patients and transplant teams are waiting and the life-saving transplants take place. It will take healthy living and medications to keep the organ working well in its new home. But some wonderful person has given the most precious gift of all, the gift of life. You too can make the decision today to sign up on your state registry as an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Any age is the right age, young or old. And any day is the right day to sign up as a donor. You can register through your driver's license office, or you can sign up right now, online. Remember to tell your family so they can support your wishes. More than 100 million people have already signed up, but we are all needed to save more lives. Go to organdonor.gov and sign up in your state donor registry as an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Go to organdonor.gov and share the gift of life. So that was a great, brief summary of the entire process. The entire process obviously has more details than that, but it's a good summary of how it works, how it goes from a deceased donor to giving a moment of hope to another family. So they were talking about an organ procurement organization. In our service area, the state of Kansas and the western two-thirds of Missouri, Midwest Transplant Network, the organization I work for, is a nonprofit that recovers all of the organs and tissues needed for life-saving transplants. Our mission is to save lives by honoring the gift of organ and tissue donation with compassion and dignity. And also our vision is leading organ and tissue donation through excellence, quality, and partnerships like within our community with you guys at K-State. So what organs can be donated? The heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the pancreas, and the small intestine. Who knows what can be donated while you're living? You don't be shy. Kidneys. Good, yeah. A kidney can, you only need one kidney to survive. So you can actually donate while you're alive, your one kidney. But also you can donate a portion of your liver. So well, the liver regenerates itself. So you can actually donate, I'm going to show you this small portion. This small portion can be donated and it will regenerate in the recipient and in yourself and become a full liver. What's great is we are in an area where we have very innovative transplant centers. Children's Mercy in Kansas City has partnered with KU Med and they are now doing a split transplant, split liver transplant therapy. And what they do is they have one deceased donor liver. And what they'll do is take this smaller portion, they'll split it right here and give a smaller portion to a kid at Children's Mercy waiting on the liver transplant waiting list, and give a larger portion to an adult waiting on the KU transplant list. So we're helping two different people with one organ. The tissues that can be donated, tendons, heart valves, veins, skin, and bones. The skin is one thing that gets some people uneasy about donation. Just so you guys know, the skin comes from the back back area only. And we only recover the skin from the back if it meets a certain measurement criteria. It has to meet a certain measurement criteria to be a good skin graft for the recipient. So, ways that we can use that, how do you think we use skin donation? Burn victims. Good, burn victims. But guess what? We are now using it um, 
to help with breast cancer survivors during the breast reconstruction. So that's also a way we're using donated skin. We take all of the long bones. Um, we take the femur, which is in your thigh. We take your tibia and fibia from the calf area. And we also take your humerus bone right here in your arm. Those can be a whole bone transplant. For instance, if someone has cancer in their arm, it can be um, taken out, removed, and transplanted. Um, or it can be broken down into a bone powder, bone paste. If someone's in a car accident and has severe jaw injuries, we can use that bone powder and bone paste to reconstruct their jaw, jaw area after the accident. I was actually at a conference and I had the privilege of listening to a recipient from the Columbine shooting. Is everyone familiar with the Columbine shooting? Okay, so she was in the library when the Columbine shooting occurred and the shooter came up and put the shotgun right on her shoulder and pulled the trigger. Um, she survived, but she was at a Denver hospital and they were talking about amputation, but they had a specialist there that said, well, let's try and give donation a try. Let's try and transplant a whole long bone. Sure enough, it worked. She got married and those moms have held three different babies. So it can definitely help a number of people. Cornea donation um, is also, also a tissue donation that can occur. Just so you know, when you donate both of your corneas, it's the contact lens portion of the eye, it's not the entire eye. A lot of people think the entire eye is donated to see if someone else sight. It's not. It's only the contact portion of the eye that gives someone else sight. And also, your cornea donation goes to two separate people. Because those cornea transplant surgeons typically only want to do one cornea transplant at a time to make sure that the recipient's body doesn't reject. So you're actually going to help two other people get the gift of sight through cornea donation. A lot of people question whether or not medical staff is going to save their life. I just wanted to make sure that you guys understood that donation, organ donation happens after brain death has been declared. So death has to be declared. And for brain death, it is very clear, and it's not like a coma. A coma is when your brain's taking a nap, <coughs> it's injured, and it's trying to recover. Brain death is irreversible. You will not come back from that. On the left-hand side of each picture, on the far left, you're going to see all of the blood vessels and the blood pumping in that brain. That means that patient is alive and well. On the right-hand side, right here, you can see that the blood flow isn't existing. So this is a brain-dead patient. They will not come back from this injury. Same here. You can see all of the colorful activity, the colorful brain activity. This patient is alive and well. And then you can see that there is not any brain activity on the right-hand side. This patient is brain dead and will not come back from this injury. And just so you guys know, there's only a 3% chance that you're going to pass away in a brain death injury. So that's why we have such a large gap between the number of people waiting for a transplant and yet we aren't able to save them quick enough. We only have about 30,000 transplants nationally per year, and yet we have 122,000 people waiting. So it's quite a big gap that we need to close. We do um, offer the donation after cardiac death process. Um, that means someone has a cardiac death in the hospital, they're already on mechanical support for some reason, and they end up having a cardiac death. Once your heart stops, all of your organs start failing. So if it's a cardiac death, we can't transplant the heart, the heart is already gone. Also the lungs immediately go out right after that, so we can't transplant the lungs after that either. However, we can possibly transplant, if we work quick enough, we can transplant the kidneys and the livers and the small intestine, plus all of the tissue. So most people actually pass away from cardiac death, which is why tissue donation is more prevalent than organ donation. In our service area just last year, we had a record number. Our record number was 200 organ donors. Our record number for tissue donors was over 1,100. So that's how much you can see the difference. So for the donation process, you kind of saw that in the video. When a patient passes away at the hospital, the hospital doesn't have access to the donor registry information. The federal government says, we want the hospital to be focused on life-saving hours. <coughs> then the recovery team will check the donor registry status. So that's when we check the donor registry. We can't get into that donor registry any earlier than getting this phone call from the hospital. I always give the example of, I have access to the donor registry. I can look up anybody's name. I am the legal next of kin to my husband, but it would be illegal and against company policy for me to even look up if my husband is a registered donor because um, that information is not protected. 
So then once we get the phone call, this is when we check the donor registry status. We want to see if the person is a first person authorized donor. If you are over the age of 18 and you have said yes to donation, we are going to move forward honoring your wish for that. Your family can't override it. Previously, your family could in the state of Kansas, but now they can't unless you're a minor. So if you're under the age of 18 or you have siblings or children that are under the age of 18, parents do get to override or legal next of gets to override that decision. And based on what the status is, we will then approach the family. We always approach a family and talk to them about organ donation. It's important for us, however the donor registry status is, for instance, if someone is listed in the donor registry status, we would then come forward to the family and let them know, your loved ones already made the decision, but we want to sit and take the time to answer any of their questions. Because if we don't, there is a family in grief that is now worried that we're not taking good care of their loved one. We want to make sure that they don't have any extra anxiety through this process because they're already going through a bath. So we make sure that we answer any and all of their questions. If the individual is not in the donor registry, then we end up approaching and asking the family, have you ever talked about it? Have you thought about it? Do you know how your loved one felt about it? So it's important that no matter how you feel about donation, that you talk to your family and let them know because we will always approach and ask about donations. This is when we begin the process. You saw the computer on the video. When we start finding a match on the United Network of Organ Sharing, and then we facilitate the entire donation and transplant process. Just so you guys know, in our service area, there is a member of the Midwest Transplant Network team with the donor at all times. Because we know that their family can't be there with them, we are acting as their family to make sure that they're there and taken care of. We want the family reassured that we're taking care of their loved one. We do also offer, offer excuse me, offer and the six foot tall K-State basketball player, right? There's two different body sizes. So it definitely um, it matters on body size as well. How sick the patient is on the wait list. Distance between the donor and the patient hospital. Also how long the patient's been waiting. Potential recipients um, health. So on the donor family side, after their loved one is deceased, uh, we begin the process of testing. We do the blood draw, we see who they're matching. Well, all of this is working on in the background. Um, the entire donation process is completed within that three days. Most of us know it's about three days after someone passes away to the funeral process. All of that is occurring within that three day time period. We do not want to delay the funeral as much as possible. So we are trying to work very fast and very quickly. Plus, we only have 24 hours to place all of those organs. So we have to move very quickly. While that's happening, the recipient gets a phone call and the recipient has to get to their transplant center and they too have to go through a gauntlet of testing before they get the transplant. And the reason why is they need to verify that that recipient isn't even battling something as simple as a small cold. If their body is already trying to fight off a small cold, if we were to take an organ and put it in there, their body would immediately reject it and that would be a wasted gift. So it's constantly moving, it's constantly, the same thing with the antibody, antibodies um, in their HLA, which is their tissue. Um, so, for that reason, just so you guys know, I always tell everybody that the wait list is it's not static, um, excuse me, it's um, not stationary. So, it doesn't, it's not like a DMV line where number one gets their match next, number two gets theirs. It's constantly moving and fluctuating. However, just like it said, it's never based on race. Uh, we always say donations, not colorblind. Um, and then also that it's also not based on celebrity status. A lot of people think that you can. Um, by your way to getting an organ, and that's not possible. So is there an age limit? Absolutely not. Just like the video said, any age is the right age, and any day is the right day to sign up. Really, the donor registry just says that I want, I'm taking a pledge that I want someone to see if I can save a life at my time of death. It doesn't give a promise that you're going to be the healthiest of all healthy people when you pass away, because none of us know when that's going to happen. All it says is that you would sure like for us to give it, give it a try. This is Miss Ruby. Miss Ruby uh, was in our service area. She's in Kansas City area. And she is actually an 80 year old liver donor. So it definitely shows that any age is the right age to give the gift of life. Will the doctor save my life? Absolutely, 100%. I've even spoken with EMTs and have said if you are in that kind of traumatic injury, we don't even care what your name is, let alone if you have that donor symbol on your driver's license. What we care about is getting you stabilized and getting you to the hospital. That's our job. 
The hospital team is responsible for our life-saving efforts. They don't care about donation and transplant. That's when we step in. So it's a very fine line about a life-saving team. So that's the hospital, ER, and ICU staff. They're there to save your life. But then once the patient's been declared brain dead, then they step away from the case, and we step in as the recovery and the transplant centers. A lot of people are curious whether or not they'll have to pay for donation. By federal law, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, the federal law says it is a gift. So you can't charge for it, you can't sell your organs, that's against federal laws. You will do prison time here in the U.S. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear, though, that who is responsible for what finances? Any life-saving effort, if there's a, say there's a car accident and your loved one is life flighted to the hospital and they're given a bunch of medications to try and revive them, all of those are life-saving efforts. So the family is responsible for all of those. However, once brain death has been declared and we move forward with the donation, Medicare, Medicaid, the recipient's insurance, we pay for all of that process. We cover all of those targets. But then the funeral arrangements are back on the family's fiscal responsibility. Any questions about that part? Okay, good. What does my religion, religion say? A lot of people are concerned that it might be against their religion. Just so you know, we have uh, the National Organization Donate Life America has done a lot of research to find out that all major religions do support organ, eye, and tissue donation as a final act of love and compassion. Some of them might have their stipulations. For instance, Greek Orthodox um, is okay with giving the gift of life, but they're not okay with giving to go to research or science. Um, so that's a little stipulation. Most of them end up basically leaving it up to the individual. Basically saying the afterlife is not dependent on whether you are or are not giving the gift of life. We do have a saying um, in our organizations that say don't take your organs to heaven because heaven knows we need them here. Will you be able to have an open casket funeral? Yes. Nothing donation related will ever prohibit an open casket funeral. If you, how many in the room have seen, even on a show, TV show, um, an autopsy? Yeah, so you know the why, there's a Y incision in the chest cavity to see the organs. So that's where we recover the organs from. Just so you guys know, on the tissue donation, the, we get all the tissue mainly from the leg area, the sides of the skin, from the back, and the eyes, right? Well, your eyes are closed in the casket. Um, we start an incision at the top of your leg and we go down to your toes, and that's where we recover. We reconstruct all bodies. We do that no matter what the funeral arrangements are. It's important for us to do that because even if the loved one had a plan of no visitation, I don't want anyone viewing my body and I want to be cremated, we will still reconstruct the body because we don't know if at a last minute a family member wants to see their loved one and say goodbye. So we will always pay that respect to our donor. However, oh, and then the humerus bone is recovered from the arm area. We do, in our service area, ask all donor families what their loved one is wearing in the casket. Because if, for instance, my mom were to say, well, she had this little strap dress that she loved wearing, we're going to have her wear that, that means we will not recover the humerus bone because there would be, re there would be reconstructive um, stitching right here that would be obvious to those attending the funeral that a donation occurred. So we will not reconstruct there. But everywhere that you saw me point at, you're covered in clothes in your casket. And the casket is shut at the bottom by your feet. So, um, nobody will ever know whether or not you are a donor and open casket funeral unless the family is telling everyone. Can my family decide about donation? If you are, like I said earlier, if you are already a registered donor, if you have that donor symbol on your heart, on your driver's license, if you go online, that means your family can't override your decision. It's our responsibility to be there to protect your decision when you're no longer there to be your own voice. So it's important for us to do that. Except for minors, like we talked about earlier, that parents do get to override the minor's decision. If a minor is in the donor registry, we'll approach the family and we'll let them know. It looks like your child supported the gift of donation, and then we offer them a decision. Um, would you like to honor that wish for your child, or would you like to override that? And they're able to make that decision. <coughs> so it's really important, though, uh, we always encourage everyone to talk to your family about donation now, because when they're going through this grief, Having to decide about donation just adds that much more grief and anxiety to them at a time when they're already trying to process your loss. 
So it's important to talk now about it so that way they can confidently say, I know exactly how my loved one felt about their emotion. So some stats and facts. We had, like I said, uh, nearly 30,000 transplants occurred in 2014. However, we just had a record year of 33,000 last year across the nation. However, we still have 124,000 people that are waiting for a national, uh, that are waiting for a life-saving organ. In our service area of Kansas and Missouri, we have 2,600 people waiting for a life-saving transplant. 80% of the people waiting are waiting for a kidney. So, I'm sorry, I know we're at K-State. I should have probably looked up your stadiums and how much is in filled with stadiums, but let me give you this uh, visual. Uh, are you guys familiar with the Chiefs in the Royal Stadium, at least watching it on TV, seeing the big screenshot? Okay, if you were to take the entire Royals and Chiefs Stadium and fill that to capacity, that's how many people are waiting for a life-saving transplant. If you take the Chiefs Stadium alone, that's how many people are waiting for a kidney. So it gives a really good visual on how many people are actually waiting for someone to make this precious gift, gift available to them. <clears throat> One person is waitlisted every six, or excuse me, every ten minutes. So by the time we're done with this meeting today, six more people will be added to that transplant waiting list. Twenty-two people die every day. I know the video said eighteen. It's now risen, unfortunately. However, the good news is 51% of the U.S. have already made the decision that they would like to donate at their time of death and have become registered donors. One organ donor can save up to eight lives, and then all of your tissue can actually help 50 plus people. So your donation with the eye donation that can help two people can actually help 60 people. These are the individuals you will help. These are Kansas and Missouri residents that have received life-saving transplants. And of course, we have Ashley in the back. So how can you help? I'm going to ask that you join your state donor registry. In Kansas, 66% 60, of the adults in Kansas are registered donors. In Missouri, there's about 73. Um, just so you know, I am a Kansas fan. Um, so I don't like that Missouri's at 73 and we're at 66. So I encourage all of you to sign up. Of our service area, we have 70% registered as donors. So how can you get registered? You saw in the video that you can actually sign up at your driver's license office. How many of you have a donor symbol, do you know? Yeah, fantastic, guys. That's wonderful. Um, one little thing that did make, just so you guys know on the inside, one change we did make this year was previously it actually said organ donor. So you might have a license that says organ donor on there. Just this year, we made a change because we felt like that didn't accurately represent that you are signed up for organ, eye, and tissue donation when you sign up at the driver's license office. So we removed the organ, and we just put the donor in the heart symbol now. And just if you're curious, that's what the Missouri donor symbol looks like. The other way you can get registered is going online. This is also where you can make specific requests. If you want to direct donate to someone, for instance, if I was a friend of Ashley, and I wanted to put that at my time of death, I would like to direct donate to her, I could put that on there. Um, this is also where you can have restrictions. You can go online and say, I only want to be an organ donor. I don't want to be a tissue and eye donor. You can do that. You can't do that if the DMV, their system doesn't allow for it, but you can do that online. By law, we have to honor your wish as long as it's not discriminatory. So um, I make a joke of this, but for instance, you can't say, I am a K-State Wildcat, don't give anything to a Kansas Jayhawk. Um, that's discriminatory. We can't do that. However, you guys can see where this could be a little more serious, someone's request. We cannot honor those kinds of discriminatory requests. And then we also have an app that we use at our community events. I encourage you guys to follow us on Facebook. We have a Midwest Transplant Network, one. We also have Donate Life Kansas. There's Donate Life Missouri. Each state has their own state team. And then we also are on Twitter, and we have a YouTube channel. But now, I'm going to turn it back over. And we're going to have Ashley come up, I believe. Yeah, we're going to have Ashley come up and share her story. So let's give her a round of applause. Okay, I'm Ashley. I work at Commerce. I know many of the faces in Tampa. For you that don't know me, that's me. Um, when I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, um, and it was an absolute life changer. Uh, being that young and having to take insulin shots every time I ate was absolutely no, no fun. Um, I remember at one point in my childhood at my cousin's house, 
my dad called me and he was so excited. He told me that um, they had started, you know, um, finding a cure for diabetes. And I absolutely broke down and cried, um, thinking that my life could go back to normal. Um, it was a little scary. A few years later, about eight to be exact, I was diagnosed with medullary cystic kidney disease. Um, I was terrified. My family, my biological family, um, all you know, have the medullary cystic. My biological mother has had a transplant. My brother has had a transplant. Um, my aunt, and now my cousin has as well. Um, it was scary. Medullary cystic kidney disease is very rare. Um, it's when your kidneys produce small cysts that make your kidneys shrink and your organ function goes down. Um, the doctors told me I would eventually need a transplant to live. It was very scary when my levels dropped to the point that I knew um, I was going to be on that waiting list. Um, I was on the waiting list for almost two years before I received the gift of life. I was called 10 different times before I finally got my match. Every time I got a call, my heart sunk, knowing that somebody had passed away um, and was willing to give that gift of life. It, it hurt, but also knowing that I might not be able to receive that um, organ that they were selflessly giving also hurt. Finally, on February 18th, 2015, I got my 10th call. They told me to stand by, just like every time before. On the 19th, they called me and told me to get to the hospital, um, to KU Med. Uh, even when I was in the hospital, they weren't for sure if it was going to be a match. They took me back to the OR on the 20th about 7 p.m. and gave me the gift of life. I thank the gentleman who was selfless enough to give the gift of life after he had passed. My philosophy is you can't take them with you when you go, so you might as well, might as well give that gift of life to someone else. Um, I'm blessed that my donor was selfless enough to donate his organs because now I'm able to spend the rest of my life raising my two beautiful children. I'm also thankful for my family who wish they could have donated a kidney to me, but in some cases like mine, a deceased donor is necessary. Um, I couldn't accept a live donor because I also needed a pancreas, and we only have one. So, um, Although I can't donate all my organs, I am still an organ donor, and if chosen to leave this earth, I would gladly give my organs to help somebody else live. Thank you, Ashley. I think... It was excellent that you shared about how you had 10 calls. I think a lot of people don't understand that sometimes it takes 10 rounds before you can find a match that works. Um, things happen. So um, it's important for all of us to sign up to give that gift of life. So thank you for sharing. Any questions for me or for Ashley? I'm sure she feels to answer anything. I was kind of wondering if somebody is diagnosed with um, cancer, are they still able to donate portions of them? Ah, great question. Um, so in case you guys didn't hear, she was wondering if you have cancer, can you be a donor? Absolutely. It just depends. We always tell everyone, your medical circumstance at your time of death is what it all depends on. And none of us know what that will be. So even a cancer patient, even though they might have a diagnosis, they could end up passing away from a car accident. So it really is dependent on that. It depends on where the cancer is spread if it's all of their body. However, just so you guys know, cancer never impacts your corneas. So you will always be able to give two different people the gift of sight. And I know that a lot of people think that organ donation is what saves lives. It is. However, I've touched numerous cornea recipients and their blindness ends up making it so difficult for them that they can't work, they can't drive, they have to stay at home, they can't do their hobbies so slowly their life is taken from them until they get that transplant. And then they can see again, they can work again, they can drive again, and their life is <coughs> back to them. So it can be just as important. Um, also, brain cancer typically stays in the brain. It typically doesn't spread to the rest of the body. So if someone has brain cancer, and it can be full brain cancer, their organs can still be functioning and working fine that they can be donated. So it definitely is all dependent. Same thing with AIDS and HIV. Um, President Obama has passed the HOPE Act, which has basically said, now before, we would not have taken, and if it was HIV or AIDS or hepatitis C, we would have ruled that out and said that we can't donate because of the disease. However, now, um, those patients that have HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis are on medications, 
that typically end up being really hard on their livers. They end up becoming where they need a liver transplant. Well, um, as medical professionals, we have come together to say, well, we can't take a perfectly fine gift that's not that doesn't have a disease and put it in a body that does have a disease that's going to pass away. That's not fair to all of those other 124,000 people waiting. So this HOPE Act has actually said, well, what if we have an HIV patient who passes away and can donate theirs? Can we not donate directly to an HIV patient? So now that's what the HOPE Act can do. It can donate HIV and AIDS patients directly to HIV and AIDS patients, same with hepatitis, and donate directly to a hepatitis. We will not, in our service area, we haven't had that kind of transplant yet. It doesn't mean that we're not cooperating. It doesn't mean that we won't um, participate in it when it happens. It just hasn't come across to our organization yet. Um, however, we will not take a diseased organ and put it in an individual who does not have a disease, just so I'm clear on that. Uh, we won't do that. We make sure it's a safe transplant. And the way we make it a safe transplant is we go through a big medical questionnaire with the family. So with the family, we end up talking about their medical and social history. We ask what kind of cancer medications were they on? Um, did they have cancer previously? If it's been five years or remission, they can be a full organ eye and tissue donation, donor. So um, it's important for us to ask all of those questions. Did they have AIDS? Do they have HIV? Those are, uh, give us red flags. Um, the social questionnaire does ask quite a number of very personal questions. We do ask loved ones about the sexual activity of the deceased. We need to make sure that it's not unsafe sexual activity. Um, in fact, to be honest with you, um, my when my grandma passed away, they called about tissue donation. And my mom was there with all of her four other siblings and my grandpa, and my grandma and grandpa had been married 50 years. So been married quite a long time. And they asked my mom, they said, we're gonna have to ask you this. It might be difficult, but did Grace have many sexual partners? And did she have any other people or pay for any kind of other sexual activity? And my mom just was like, um, no. She was married to grandpa for many plus years. However, there are situations where a loved one does know where there might be some risky behavior, drug use, um, risky sexual behavior that we need to make sure that we know so that way we can make sure it's a safe transplant for recipients. But that's a good question about the medical side of things. Any other questions? I sure appreciate you guys coming. So feel free, it looks like there's some more goodies back there. And then also, please, before you go, come up and get some goodies up here too. I have emery boards, bracelets, and some tissues. So thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat>